Hey everybody, how's it going out there? I am Jim Davis. This is a WebDM live stream. We're going to be talking about Mordenkainen's uh, Mordenkainen presents Monsters of the Multiverse here pretty soon. And uh, but oh, there I, I can hear myself. I thought I'd muted, but no, it never happens. The gremlin that lives inside my computer always finds a way uh, for me to get some feedback. But that's all right. That's how these shows kind of go. So we're going to be hanging out later uh, for the rest of the next hour or so and talking about uh, the new race options for uh, Mordenkainen's. I hope to get through uh, all of the Fs, <laughs> but we'll see. There's over 33 uh, or so uh, new options for player races, updates for that. Uh, and then uh, later on, uh, in the coming weeks, we'll get through uh, to the bestiary and the changes to the monsters that are there and all the various <laughs> updates and and uh, the like to the stat blocks that pretty much change the way that monsters are played uh, in some situations, especially spellcasters. Um, but right now we're going to be talking about uh, the fantastical races in Mordenkind Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. Uh, but before then, just to give you guys a bit of an update, We've got some new shows over on our Twitch channel that will eventually be migrating over to the YouTube channel. But if you want to catch them live, if you want to uh, be in the chat uh, and talk and hang out, uh, be sure to catch those uh, over on our Twitch channel. That's uh, Sunday nights at 8 p.m. Uh, with me, <laughs> uh, Nightcap, where pretty much just talking about whatever is on my mind at that time of the week and winding down from the weekend, getting ready to start the work week. This last week, we talked about the new UA, uh, where I speculated for all the different kinds of <laughs> barbarians that I want to make uh, that just get huge, like big goblins and bugbears and the like. So I have a lot of fun over there. That's Sunday nights at 8 uh, and then on Tuesdays at eight, our CEO, uh, Emma, is over playing Adventure Time uh, and hanging out with our uh, Twitch and audio content producer, Rudy Basso. The two of them talk snacks, uh, weird foods. They're playing one of the monkey islands, I think. Uh, I don't know. I'm putting our son to bed at, the, <laughs> at that time. Uh, but you can go and hang out with them over there Tuesdays at eight. Uh, and then there's Between Two Turns, uh, which is Thursdays at eight. Uh, again, over on our Twitch channel tonight, uh, Emma's interviewing uh, Mike Sly Flourish, right? Like just, it's, it's going to be really cool. Uh, and to listen to his, his process and how he, uh, how he creates the lazy DMs method. So go and check that out over on our Twitch channel tonight at eight. And, um, you know, if you can't, they will eventually make their way over to the YouTube channel uh, when we have the time to do so. So yeah, keep an eye on that. Um, and if you're really hurting for more WebBM content, if you're just like, you can't get enough, you just need more, you can always head over to our Patreon where we've got weekly podcasts and more. So, um, yeah, go check it out. See what you like. Hey, you know, who knows what'll happen? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to uh, take a drink here. We will be taking questions from chat probably about halfway through the stream or so, or intermittently as I, uh, remember and and as my whim takes me so if you want to make sure your question gets seen be sure to write question in front of it either in all caps uh, or not you know if you forget that's fine don't feel like shouting that's all right too but make sure we know it's a question you'd like for us to see uh so yeah <clears throat> excuse me there we go hey everybody I hope everybody's doing good this is a uh, kind of a mid late week Thursday hangouts. It's it's, uh, it's been a, a weird month <laughs> for me. I feel like I've been in the Black Lodge for the last four weeks and like woke up and was like, when did May was I was it was just April. Uh, so it's good to be in June. Summer is in the air. And uh, I got my hands on a new D&D book this past week and have been slowly working my way through it. Um, this is the new uh, New book that's got all the race options, the updated monsters, and the like. It's one of those weird books where, okay, it's it's got some stuff that's really vital for players, and then a whole bunch of it, <laughs> you know, the the majority of the book was like off limits to players, as well as. But you know, typical of a five e book, um, for the most part, it, it it's compiling things from a variety of sources. Uh, that have been in previous Dungeons and Dragons books. So it's a bit of an update on those. Not a ton of new 
stuff, more of a fresh coat of paint and making things work just a little better um, in the uh, run up to, you know, whatever it is that we get in 2024. Um, so, yeah, let's see. Uh, let's jump right in. Excuse me. All right. So. I don't know, unless you've been living <laughs> under a rock <laughs> or just don't really pay attention to these kinds of things, um, D&D has been going through these uh, changes to the way that they present the player race options for characters to remove elements of bioessentialism and to make the lore accessible both to new players and less uh, like specific to any one D&D campaign world. So like the information in Volos describes the way things work in the Forgotten Realms, not necessarily every D&D campaign world out there. And you can look at something like uh, the Orcs as an example, because how they're presented in Volos and how they're presented in Eberron and then how they're presented in Wildmount are three very different takes on the same uh, fantasy concept. And so Monsters of the Multiverse is an attempt to like take all of those elements of you know the different humanoids and and other types of creatures that players really want to play they really want to make characters of uh, and they really want to like engage with the story elements that are embedded in those concepts but don't necessarily want to play these particular drow or these particular orcs or these particular asimar or whatever and so it's it's always been the case that D and D has had this multiverse, which represents every campaign that is played. Uh, you know, every every version of D and D, every every homebrew, the like, supposedly all takes place within the same um, you know prime material plane in these various iterations of it. And in theory, uh, you know, one character can go from one campaign to another. <clears throat> and so, the idea that there's a multiverse of fantasy races out there and that they have a multiplicity of expressions as is to me is a part and parcel of DD from the beginning and this is what uh, this book's bringing out unfortunately it it's taking away some of the specificity of those individual campaign settings that i think really makes uh, for a lot of compelling um, you know potential at the game table but you just have to add that back in, right? It, it's it's not a it's no big thing to just say you know like well this is the this is the way my elves work or you know or or my fur bogs work or you know my bugbears whatever uh, you know it's it it's uh, letting you do that I think without having to remove as much so it's pretty cool um, but let's dive into the uh, some of the changes <laughs> as the mechanical expressions of these ideas so uh, the chapter kind of starts out with a bit of update over how you make a character using the new rules. So basically you get plus two, plus one uh, to any ability score or plus three or sorry, plus one to three ability scores. And I like this. Uh, I've tried to play like halfling wizards and, <laughs> you know, it sucks to start off with a 15 in your prime stat. Like there's just no way around it, uh, especially in the lower levels. It's much more difficult to, like have your spell stick or or you know hit with your spell attacks or the like if you're if you don't have that plus three in your uh, in your primary stat so i like this change always have um so house house rule i've used for years so i like it <laughs> uh, and then the rest of uh these changes address things like all right what kind of languages do they speak everybody speaks common plus another of your choice like it's just like very simple there's less of like you know someone ending up with two or three languages that they're never going to use it's never going to come up uh so you know players get a chance to actually pick something that's meaningful to them as players and that fits with the game that they're playing and then i think that's another good change um the <laughs> the, the stuff that I'm, I'm not really a huge fan of is like the lifespan and then height and weight and I know some of that just gets moved to the descriptions and, and there's, I don't have a problem with it being like, oh, it's basically like humans. Right. But I, it feels, I don't know, it just, I, I like having the option to go, I, I don't want to pick. Can I just roll the C and can you give me like a range band? And yeah, I guess we can use the ones in the player's handbook. Like uh, uh, this one suggests, but there's just something about it. Like, you know, I, I want it to be specific to this, you know, to this uh, turtle or the bugbear or Goliath or whatever. Like, I, I don't know, it's a little thing, but uh, yeah, it's, 
it sticks out to me. So let's see. I dive right into it because there are a lot of these. <laughs> uh, and we're starting right off the bat with Eric Kokra. So I really like Eric Kokra. I, I have a, a Eric Kokra Ranger that I've played several times uh, named Death from Above. That's really fun. And that uh, 50 foot uh, fly speed was nice. But the fact that you really can't do much with it to boost it or or anything is, you know, ultimately sucks. So bringing flight down to walking speed is just it makes so many DMs lives much easier. Like, to me, flight in a PC is not as much of a problem as being able to move significantly faster than something like the rest of the party. And like, I know that's Monk's shtick <laughs> and, and maybe it comes from uh, playing with uh, with Pruitt a lot, who likes to play really fast characters and speedsters and the like. But I find personally as a GM, I have much more trouble managing and, and presenting meaningful situations and challenges for a speedster type character, someone that's really fast, uh, as opposed to a flyer. Um, the annoying thing with flyers is when it's just one person in the party has on-demand flight and everyone else doesn't. Um, it, it's annoying to me because you, the challenges that you can use for flyers don't really work for non-flyers. Uh, it, it's also annoying because that player will usually get attacked more often because they're flying in the open. You know, they're not in cover or anything like that. They're an obvious target. Uh, and so enemies tend to uh, target them more. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's how I take care of flyers at low level. Um, so yeah, I, I like Eric Okra. I like bird people, winged talons. You should be able to smite and get monk stuff with your talons. That's a no brainer. Um, but uh, yeah, I really like it. And again, you get to cast Gust of Wind, one of my favorite spells now, which uh, ties them uh, more strongly to the Plane of Elemental Air, which is about all the lore that they have. Like, what more do you need? They're, they're bird people. They do bird people things. Uh, and they they come from the Plane of Air where they fly all the time. Like, maybe the, you have an Eric Hopper that's like, longs to return to that and like, can't just can't find a portal back or, or whatever. But um there's the other thing that reminds me of is like there's this uh this is a weird tangent but it's, it's my favorite story about flight uh it's one of the first astro city comics where it's like the, their version of superman is like counting up the seconds of flight time he has in a day of being not superman right between pretending to do a day job and saving the world multiple times it's like three minutes of flight or something and when he sleeps he just dreams of being able to fly without it being like getting somewhere as fast as he can go to just like float and soar through the clouds. And like, I don't know, there's something about that of just, if you could fly uh, and, and stay aloft and you know soar through the sky, but you just don't ever really get to as much as you'd like. Uh, I don't know, maybe there's something to that. Maybe there's an, uh, an adventuresome idea for a character there, but um, I like Eric Cochran. I just, I do. So there you go. Uh, let's see who's next ah yes the poor <laughs> the poor asimar all right so if you uh, decided that you're like oh i got this book that means i don't need volos anymore uh, you would be mistaken uh, volos has a ton of lore for most <laughs> of the uh, uh fantastical races found here as well as the monsters and so don't get rid of it hang on to it uh because it, asimar is sort of like the first case example of, of the the way that like Pairing things down, uh, making the concepts fit for a, a variety of campaign settings and campaign types involves ne necessarily a stripping away of the specific lore of Asimar as they exist uh, in the Forgotten Realms. And so if you like that, if you've built your homebrew on that, or you like being inspired by it, you're going to have to go back to those, what they're calling on D&D Beyond, the legacy books, uh, in order to find that, because Asimar, you get, you know, two very short paragraphs and a D6 table, uh, as opposed to the two-page treatment that they got uh, in Volos. Excuse me. So for some, that's a plus. You know, they, they like building up from minimal foundations to something that's exactly what they want. Um, but for others, having the specificity uh, of Volos uh, missing will be, uh, will be a real loss. So, yeah, I mean, 
I think it's a matter of personal taste, but um, it, it is it something is missing. Uh, so just uh, it's notable. <clears throat> Otherwise, there's also no sub races here. Right, they're not. You don't like have Asimar, and then half of your traits come from that, and then the other come from Scourge or whatever the other ones were called. Uh, <laughs> instead, you have a a single uh, ability that you're going to pick, and like I don't know, it's just it feels like a loss. Uh, I know that the damage is toned down, but to me, it, it's less about that and more about you know the different expressions of the same idea being meaningful. Uh, and so you know, I don't know. This this is one that I. I was like, oh, that guy sucks, but that's all right. <laughs> I'm not too uh, too broken up over it. <laughs> uh, let's see. But this next one, my, I, so I love bugbears. And uh, I, I absolutely love bugbear. The, uh, the etymology of it is essentially boogeyman, right? Like you, you look up, um, you know, bugbear, it's, it gets all kinds of bugaboo or, or, or boogeyman or something. And the first illustration of a bugbear in D&D is just this weird scarecrow, pumpkin-headed looking creature that's like next to a ghoul. And, it, and so it's just like, what, what is this thing? And then even as they become like big, hairy goblins, like just the idea that they're big, hairy goblins is fun to me. Like in my campaign world, bugbears are older goblins. Goblins never stop growing. And a goblin that lives long enough will get to be bugbear sized. And that means you have a creature that's had the cunning of a goblin for 80 something years. And now is like an orangutan gorilla bear thing, <laughs> right? Like it's, they're terrifying creatures. Um, but I also like bugbears because they remind me of like lions in, a, in the, just a sense of like, what's a bugbear doing 90% of the time? It's probably taking a nap. I, it wants to be left alone. And the other 10% of the time, it's engaged in horrific, bloody violence. And then it's just going to go back to sleep and you know, sleep, sleep it off <laughs> after it's gorged itself. Uh, and so to see them like, you know, the, the creatures from the Feywild that have been, uh, you know, brought out and, and adopted by these foreign gods and, and the like is, is interesting. I think that's really cool. Um, again, we're missing some of the Volo stuff, but I'm, you guys know, uh, I'm not gonna repeat myself every time about it, uh, uh, but it's missing here. Uh, but just the idea that goblinoids as, as overall are from the Feywild, like elves, I really like them. That's, that's an idea I've used many times in campaign uh, where, where most of the monsters are from other places and made their way to the material plane. And like goblinoids are, are part of that. You know, they're, they're born from, from places of sorrow or loss or, or conflict, uh, hatred, you know, the, the, that in, in, the, in the oily shadows of those places bubble forth little goblins and, you know, the like. Or when, when the elf lords ride through the land on the wild hunt, they do so with a retinue of hobgoblins whose, you know, iron shod boots keep them in line and allow the, uh, the wild fae to, to be controlled. So I'm loving all this. It's really cool. And they buffed, <laughs> they buffed stealth and, and surprise attack. Like, I don't think anything changed. They get a bonus to end charmed or resisted. The surprise attack can now be used more than once and doesn't actually rely on surprise, which thank goodness, because despite playing two bugbears and seeing one other one played, I've never seen that uh, race feature used. Um, and then they can squeeze through small spaces. Like, it's just, it's cool. It's overall, like, I, they were already one of my favorites more so now um and, and i really i really dig in what they're doing with the goblinoids and tying them to the fey wild uh, in the same way that elves are tied just love it absolutely love it mm. overall i started counting there are a lot of creatures that are either from the fey wild or like have the fey type uh, although some uh, weirdly don't and um, it's, it's just, it's one of those things where I'm like, when are they going to put out like a setting book <laughs> for, the, for the actual Feywild? Like you could have a full on just, just using uh, options of, uh, you know, races from the Feywild 
for a campaign and you'd be fine. There are plenty of options. So anyway, I'm not, I'm going to answer some of y'all's questions here before I continue because I like Bud Bear. I don't want to want to uh, go on too long about it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, here we go. Uh, Dragon Mind Podcast asked, do you think the changes in this book are worth purchasing it if you already have Volos and Tomophos? Not if you're happy with them. Um, the, I think some things are are for the better. Like most of the changes to the uh, to the player races are, I think, for the better. They either tone down something that needed toning down, or like bring in stuff from the racial feats. Is just make it a, a core part of it. Like if you're interested in playing any of the Ganassi or any of the, the um, like kobolds or something like that, it, it's worth it. Um, but if you're happy with those books, if you like the monsters that are in them, you don't mind that you have to read some extra traits or look up some spells uh, to, to uh, play those monsters, then all you'd really need to know is that they buffed the hit points of a lot of them and brought up the damage that most of them did uh, to be in line with their CR. You can do that yourself just by rolling some extra dice <laughs> whenever uh, uh, you roll damage or uh, you know add some extra hit points onto them so if you like those books you're happy with them there's really no need uh to get it you know unless you got players who are wanting to use uh the options um this book seems tailor-made for dnd's purchase of dnd beyond or wizards of the coast purchase of dnd beyond because you know you just buy the ones you want and don't worry about the others so i, I suspect there's a reason that yeah it's like that but yeah who knows andrew holland asked <clears throat> Do you see customized origin to be the standard uh, now that every book from uh, from Bisbon's onward has it? I, I yeah, I, I assume that that'll be the standard moving forward, uh, and then that whatever player's handbook uh, gets put out in 2024, that'll be the standard there. And I don't like it's fine, <laughs> you know. I for the people who are you know who like having the guidelines of like you know elves dexterity and, and intelligence you know uh, you know dwarves strength and, and con like if, if they if they want that i hope those suggestions are there for them like you know if you're you know you, everybody gets these uh ability score increases and then within the racial write-ups there's just like suggested increases you know i can see something like that but to me how important ability scores have become with each iteration of D D. And and like how tied they are to this bounded accuracy to the to the math that powers the game, like I'm saying, like I I played a, a halfling wizard with a 15 starting intelligence, the highest I could get with the method of character creation, and like was consistently just felt like I was. I, I eventually I was like, I'm not even really going to try to do a bunch of damaging stuff in combat. Like I'm going to buff my allies, defend myself, and, and use things that don't rely on you know needing. Uh, saving throw or an attack roll just because being one point behind was noticeably uh you know noticeably affected by play experience um so i mean it it it, it was just one of those things where i was like oh yeah i could i could see why this would just really put a damper on a first time player's experience of the game when they're told make whatever you want it's okay and i think like that's the uh that's the ethos there. Appreciate that, uh, Dracus. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, super chat there. Um, I think it fits the ethos of the play of make what you want, play your character. Character is, uh, is about like self-expression. It's it's about being able to imagine yourself as this other person to going on these adventures, experiencing these situations and things. Having the mechanics not line up with that just like throws you out of that experience, no matter how you like to enjoy that. Um, and so I think that that'll be the, uh, that'll be the standard, um, and, you know, that's fine. D and D has got to evolve <laughs> if it's going to be relevant, if it's going to, you know, uh, have another surge in popularity 30 years later or whatever, you know, it's got to evolve and change and, you know, that's fine. That's how it goes. Uh, Scotty Mouse gas. <clears throat> There's a lot of talk online about how game breaking or OP the player's options in the book are. I, as a DM disagree. Could you share your thoughts on this? I haven't found too many that are that are game breaking uh, or or OP. I mean, if anything, like 
the Asimar damage buffs been tuned way down, <laughs> like getting uh, plus your level uh, and going from that now to, to just your play, uh, your proficiency bonus is a huge drop. Um, I, you know, I mean, I think there's there's always going to be edge cases, edge cases in, in weird situations where for the, you know, for a particular player with a particular build in a particular game, this is just un, unworkable unplayable and it might be that that those situations come up more with certain combinations right like the one that comes off the top of my head really is like elves and elven accuracy just you know being able to roll three dice and take the one that you want it just it, it just feels like all right all right all right this this was too much you know um but i haven't come across anything that that seems too op especially given most of the monsters in this book have gotten a serious boost uh, and, and been made easier to play. There's some weird stuff going on narratively with them, like why their weapons deal force damage <laughs> when they're wielding them versus someone else. Um, th those things rub me the wrong way uh, as a DM from like a world building perspective. But I, you know, I don't see anything in the player stuff, the player side of things that's like, oh, no, I would not allow this or or whatever there, there's things i question I'm, I'm still questioning why centaurs you know <laughs> we'll get to in a minute uh appreciate that alex thank you and uh and like I, I i don't see why yonti need to be a player race i think they're essentially like gnolls in that they are uh, monsters they're they should be fiends uh or monstrosities um, and instead of the option, but, but there's plenty of campaigns where playing a snake person or a hyena person is just just the right move, you know, uh, and they want something more than a reskin of something else. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure that I, I really see a lot of things that are game breaking are, are OP. I think there's always going to be options that are on paper look really good or you know, something that went from once a long rest or once a short rest to like players uh, or, or proficiency bonus per long rest. Like there's the potential for abuse there. If, if you, you know, have a play style where everybody just burns through other resources in one fight or, or something, but I mean, no rule is going to stop your players from doing that and ruining their own fun, <laughs> you know, uh, that they have to learn to, uh, conserve to hold back to to not always go for the most optimal um you know and sometimes as a dm you just need to step in and say hey i know we're having fun here i know this is you know this is really neat but from my side of things i can see this heading towards a, re a real problem i, I want to make sure that xyz doesn't come up in the course of us enjoying this game and then you sort of work from there to tone down or readjust something that's not working um, cause in theory, everything in here is subject to DM's approval. There is a sentence. I saw it somewhere in the book. <laughs> it's at the, it's, it's tucked away right here at the top of, I was like, Oh, you, you, you may, if you feel like it and remember to ask your DM to see if it's cool, if you use these, but I'll consult with your DMs to see whether an option here is appropriate for your campaign. Um, I never had a player consult with me before they made a character. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I never really, I, I ran one game where I was like, please consult me first. And, and you know, my players were like, I want to play an elf. Like, yeah, there are no elves. So, yeah, anyway, that's a, another story. But, uh, but yeah, I, you know, it, it's, it, I don't see any things that are really uh, OP. And it's such a subjective thing. Otherwise, it's, it's hard to, uh, to, to say like what a DM should do other than, uh, talk to the player and let them know it's going to break the game <laughs> and that they, if they like the game, they should stop. Uh, yeah. All right. I'm going to do one more in before I jump back in it. Cause I want to, uh, I want to talk about centaurs as players for a minute, player characters for a minute. Uh, let's see <clears throat> where we go. Jack one spade. Just a sec. Oh, Jack one spade. I feel this question, Jack. Do you think Wizards will ever make a new campaign setting? I haven't seen one since Eberron from them. 
Uh, an interior veil was too vague to count. Well, I disagree about the interior veil uh, setting as, as well as the cosmology of it. They were do something, doing something very new in fourth edition. And it's been my, my new kick to go back and, uh, you know, like dive into the lore of those. So it is, it, it is not as detailed or as like extensive as the Forgotten Realms or Greyhawk or, or even Eberron. Um, I, that's a feature to me. The, it, it's ready-made for your campaign in a way that those others uh, have an obstacle or a hurdle to because of their lore. Uh, whereas the Nintir Veil is like, uh, it's a points of light setting where the, you know, everything you can list off the top of your head about D and D is in there. Uh, and, you know, it's all remixed and it's, it's ready for adventure right now uh, is what I liked about it. But anyway, it's too vague for you. It's too vague for you. I hope they make a new campaign setting. My worry is that fan culture just in general is is antithetical to doing new things because it's it, there it's frankly hard to do new things <laughs> it's it's easy to mess them up it's, it's easy to to botch the execution or to present something that's just warmed over rehashed from something else um I, I i think it's it's tough for for fans especially ones that are like really die hard who, who would you know, be clamoring for a new campaign setting to be satisfied. I, I think it's it. There's a a search for something that just isn't going to be found because you can't really approach it the same way again. You're not, you're not going to get that same first time. Like, oh my god, this is so amazing! Can you believe what ideas they're playing with here? The cool stuff that's going on and the things the players can do. Oh my god! Like, in a sense. Um, you know, trying to get that back or trying to get something that, that appeals or that that you can get excited about is, is tough and so it's easier to just go back to the same source over and over again or, or update something uh, you know so what i want to see out of a new DD campaign setting is what i saw in eberron for third edition which was eberron was we took the game that third edition delivered, not the one they talked about or promised or whatever, but the one that as it actually played where magic items were a huge deal. And, and really the sweet spot of this game is somewhere before level eight or so and made a world that works for that. And, and that accounts for the D and isms that incorporates them. It, it's a modern world. It looks like a modern world. It has modern uh, ideas and concepts in it, as opposed to the quasi medieval Renfair world that a lot of the uh, traditional D&D is. And so I think it, it works. And I want to see a new setting that, that does that, that, that presents us with a, a world that we can adventure in that's filled with conflicts and mysteries and, and threats and no one to solve them. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, everyone who could do something about it is just making it worse. And it, it's there for the the, the the party to get involved in because the dm was like this is the one that we're gonna start out with or, or this is the one you guys have you know decided you want to get mixed up in you want to tackle this problem let's do it and well let's play it out and change this campaign world and, and that's what i really want um it's, it's part of why i've been so excited about the magic the gathering um option uh, options because it's new it's different even though it's from another game it's, it's still something different still something new uh, and so, yeah, I, um, I hope they make a new one. I just worry that they won't because they're, they just will do a new thing, but I don't know, maybe they'll do like they're doing, they'll do more of what they're doing with spell jammer, which is like updating a setting, but then adding new stuff and incorporating things from other additions into it. You know, good for them. It'll show us something new. That's, that's all I really want. <laughs> All right, I'll get some of the other questions here in a minute. Cause I want to dive in. I <laughs> Centaur is next on this and um <clears throat> I, I, I don't know like I, how many people out there have ever played a game or run a game of DD in which characters with large mounts uh, were anything other than a hassle um you know like it, it's it's one of those things where just there's something about D D that horses or horse or four-legged creatures are, are eventually hit this wall of inconvenience and they've done their best with the centaur there, there's not much that changes from this uh from ravnica i believe and it, other than increasing the uh the hoof damage but it's like i conceptually i i have trouble visualizing specifically a centaur because of the horse 
And I think D&D solved this with the Bariar from Planescape, where they're mountain goats and they're sure-footed and they're smaller and they can like hop and climb and and like it to me just like it, it makes um it makes more sense in, in a weird way as, as as weird as that is to talk about centaurs and goat people <laughs> like but i don't know conceptually i just i have a hard time with a centaur because it's like are you in a forest i should go break your hoof that's gonna be bad you know <laughs> they're gonna have to put you down it suck it sucks you know i'm so sorry i love horses i absolutely love them uh, but the centaur, I, I just find, is an odd choice. Le- Leonin isn't in here. The other cat person. Come on, they, we could we could get a uh, a Leonin update. That'd be awesome. Um, but no, nope, that's centaur. So, all right, I'm not gonna be too bummed about it. So we're gonna move on to Changeling, uh, which gets its Eberron uh, lore scrubbed and is basically a Fey. They're they're from the Fey Wild. Uh, which I'm guessing that that's sort of like they're tying doppelgangers that uh, there as well, but I don't really see much in uh, mention here of the doppelgangers. Um, Changeling, of course, is you know fairy tale myth. Of, you know, a baby that swapped out for an elf for a wooden statue or a goblin or something. So I think that works as a creature from the Feywild. Um, it, it's really, I really think it's kind of cool. And they like <laughs> they finally kind of fixed the ability. Uh, for the changeling who can change their shape to actually change their size uh, instead of just looking like they've changed their size. Uh, so I really like that. Changeling is one of my favorite uh, races that I have never played simply because they can change their, their appearance. The shenanigans potential of that, the, just the ability to, to, to get into trouble, to, to do plots and schemes and all kinds of things is so high that uh, I, I love them. I absolutely love them. And I, I think the, uh, the lore swap on this one works. It fits, uh, even if personally my uh, uh, doppelgangers come from the far realm. So uh, <laughs> maybe I'll consider making a change uh, or something. All right. Let's see what's next. Deep Gnome. Goodness. Here we go. Um, the Sverf Neblin. Uh, uh, have, have seemed to have undergone a change. It looks like they got a bit of their uh, race racial feet uh, folded in, but no longer can be uh, permanent, <laughs> undetectable through divination magic uh, like they used to be able to. Uh, instead, they can only do it uh, once uh, or with a, like spending a spell slot. Um, they also get disguised self. So, yeah, they're deep gnomes. Um, they're no longer a sub race of gnome. They're just their own thing. Um, no sunlight sensitivity, 120 foot dark vision. I mean, I to me, the deep gnome is like just I don't know, another kind of dwarf. And, and this I, this is really one of those how I've done my own um, <laughs> my own uh, what to do with the diminutive subterranean uh, player races that proliferate in in D and D is deep gnomes, dwergar gnomes dwarves kobolds they're all the same they all describe the same people uh but uh, that's in my own uh, homebrew didn't make it into this one uh, unfortunately uh here the deep gnome is just you know a uh, gnome that lives underground they're still strong right they still have no magic resistance gnomish magic resistance uh which is advantage on intelligence wisdom and charisma saving throws against spells Less strong with the changes to the uh, NPC spellcaster stat blocks uh, than it was before, but still pretty, uh, pretty good trait. I don't know I, I like deep gnomes. I, I like I like the idea of one that's just on the surface. You know, so how'd you get up here? I got lost. I get turned around. The horizon is too much, and you know, and, and you find them like maybe under a big umbrella. Uh, or something like that, or, or a rocky overhang, then it won't leave their tent. Uh, so, you know, unless it's night. Uh, so it, it, those are, those are fun things. I, I like a, a, you know, fish out of water sort of PC of like, I'm far away from home. And, but while I'm here, I might as well have an adventure. Uh, and then I'll, I'll get back later. It's fine. You know, if I, if I got a high enough level, I'll just teleport there. It's cool. I know the, I know the uh, sigil sequence. So, <laughs> that's a uh that's a fun one all right Ooh, dwergar 
I have a special place in my heart for Dwergar because of one of Emma's characters uh, and, and really, really enjoyed uh, her take on it. The, the, the picture uh, that accompanies the, uh, the Dwergar in this just looks too wholesome for me. I, I really like the Dwergar lore in uh, Mordenkind's Tome of Foes. The, the sort of like, this is a clan of dwarves that was trapped in the Underdark and the dwarven gods didn't answer their prayers. You know, and when they came back, and, you know, having been captured by mind flayers and do, doing what they had to do to survive, the dwarven gods were like, no, you, you did gross things while we couldn't hear you or didn't listen. It was just like, to me, the having a very relatable motive for why a whole civilization gives the rest of a D&D world the middle finger and says, nope, we are out of here. You know, you have, you've shown us that you know, that. Uh, you have no concern for our well-being. We're going it alone. And if we see you in our tunnels, we're going to riddle you full of psychic blasts. Um, I, I kind of like that. So I like the default lore for, for Dwergar. Um, you know, their, their experience, their historical experience of life on a D&D world has, has uh, led them to this sort of civilizational outlook, even if individual Dwergar uh, have variants within that. So I love them. I think it's really cool. And they're more playable now because <laughs> you no longer lose all your cool stuff if you're in sunlight, which while in, uh, fun for a monster or a bad guy uh, is less so for a player given, um, you know, how much of a game probably takes place in the open air during the day. So that's kind of cool. I like that. But for the most part, again, where they're not, they're not uh, sub race of dwarfs, they're just dwarves. Uh, and they get all the uh, the good stuff there uh, that uh, you would expect, including psionic fortitude, which is uh, advantage to end uh, or resist charmed or the stunned condition, meaning that uh, we we got some uh, mind flayer hunters on our hands here. <laughs> you know, uh, so I think that's pretty cool. And I like Dwergar, you know, I, I, I like if you just treat him as just another kind of dwarf. It's just like these are dwarves that are from the deep tunnels. Right, they they just never come up to the surface, and maybe like once a generation, you know, one of the dwarves from that uh, that particular clan is like, we well, got to go up, and you got to you got to mix it with our surface cousins. You got to visit the hill dwarves, you know. <laughs> you got to go see some halflings, figure out what the humans are up to. You know, can we still trust gnomes? Are they still cool? You know, like, I, you know, I just don't know anymore. We, we, somebody needs to find out. And it's not because they're insular. It's just they're so, like, into their work. And they live so long. And, and like, you're in, you're down in a cave, you know, a quarter of a mile beneath the, 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 you know, the world's spine of the edge, whatever mountains. You know, you're like, what, what century is it? When was the last time we went outside? Send up that guy. He's got the lowest charisma. He'll he'll figure it out. That's well. That's the kind of character I'll play. <laughs> anyway. Uh, all right. So next, uh, I'm I'm very sad about what they did to the uh, to the Eladrin, um, because they um, they went from a really you know like flavorful, interesting, like deep lore uh, to a D four table and a paragraph. <laughs> And they're not fae. I'm really upset about that. Like, seriously. Like, of all the elves to be actual fae, this seems like the one that would be, especially because they're not like a, a sub-race of elf anymore. They're just Eladrin uh, or Eladrin, whichever way I pronounce it that time. Um, so I you know, really, it, I know why. I get it. Everything is getting pared down, simpler, more accessible, uh, you, you know, easier to build up the lore you want for your homebrew game. Uh, or for, you know, your expression of your character. But at the same time, you know, I think I feel like this baby got thrown out with the bathwater. It's too bad. Also, I really, my, I, the, everything hinging on face step is, is just one of those, I think that's maybe a legacy of fourth edition that I never really picked up on. Because for me, Eladrin are planar entities that serve chaotic good beings in the same way that like, Asimon and uh, you know the other specific type of celestial serve uh, lawful good, uh, neutral good entities, and so these are the basically like elven angels. <laughs> you know they they serve the, uh, the 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 courts of the elven gods uh, in in the various uh, upper planes, 
And so like the shift of them to just sort of like minor fey, and then now they're just sort of like another type of elf. It's like, we don't, honestly, we don't need more elves. Uh, we just don't. And <laughs> I, it, it's a missed opportunity to play like a noble fey, where you could be like the scion of, of an arch fey that's like, no, screw you, mom, dad. I'm, I'm going to go do my own thing. I'm not going to be your, uh, be your warlock. I, I, you know, or, I'm taking the ancient oath. I'm going to go to the mortal worlds to defend the wild places. Uh, okay, like that's that's what the kind of uh, Eldred I want to play, and I just I don't know, I'm not feeling these. Maybe, maybe next edition, I'll uh, I'll play that character. So we'll see. What's next? Ooh, fairies. Okay, so this is from uh, Wild Beyond the Witchlight. I don't think much changed with it. Um, I I guess I missed the re uh, large reduce the first time around because I felt like a small fairy ought to be able to become tiny. You ought to be able to fly through a keyhole or something like that to unlock a door from the other side. Like that's, that's what I want my fairy rogue to do. <laughs> Honestly, that's how they pick a lock by going inside the tumbler and just moving the, <laughs> moving the parts of it with their body. Um, so I, I, I kind of like that. It's fun. It'd be nice if it was, if it wasn't tied to a spell, it was more just like a feature like uh, the bug bears, but you know, they're they can, they're a small flyer they can cast fairy fire they yeah uh, <laughs> they're a fairy i think it's like this is really one of those options where the kind of class you pick to go along with it is really important and defines a lot about how that character will be, will be expressed mm -hmm. because i found just like with wild beyond the witch light when i'm looking at him now it's like i don't really get much like i'm small i can fly i can i got a couple of fairy themed spells okay like that, that's nice uh, uh so i really was hoping that there would be a bit uh a bit more to it or or something else but um you know it's not the end of the world definitely if anybody keeping count we're up to something like four or five uh fairy themed or fey wild themed uh races so far <laughs> so it's uh in, there's a lot i think Surprisingly enough, not fur bogs, uh, which are the next uh, next ones. I'm glad I didn't say that without trying to put in another L, which I usually try to do. So fur bogs are, uh, I don't know, they're, this is a, a, a race that like when I first encountered them in the second edition Monstrous Compendium, they were more like Vikings. You know, they sort of like dwelt deep in the forests and but their their art had a, had a strong... Uh, Viking bent to them. And so I always took them as being, you know, there's, they're shorter than other giants, but appear to be uh, more civilized than hill giants, or at least uh, more, uh, you know, more willing to trade with, uh, you know, the mortals uh, that they, that they live next to, as opposed to predate on them. Um, so I think like switching them to being like a foresty druidy type giant is kind of cool. I, I really like that idea. And in my campaign, they're fey as well uh, and, and not humanoid. They're, they're a fey giant. Um, and, and so I think that uh, that's, I like that, that story, right? The, the, the wild man of the woods or the wild people, the green man, right? Of, of a, a reclusive sort of creature that, uh, that, that lives in the woods, that has a strong connection uh, to nature, and that might venture out from the forest to protect it, to deal with some greater threat uh, or something like. Fur bogs are one of those one of those uh, options for players where I'm like, I don't know that there's a civilization of fur bogs. I think there's just individual fur bogs that maybe pass on whatever culture they have by word of mouth, uh, but that there's not like a city of them or or a nation of them. There's just individual ones that you may or may not meet. Uh, and, and so, you know, they, they live for so long that, you know, just two or three of them living in the same, uh, you know, woods, you know, they're, they're going to go through how many generations of peasants that are cutting wood in that, uh, that forest, hunting small game. You just know, like, yeah, the, when, when the green people show up, you know, show them respect, <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll guide you out of the woods if you're lost at night uh, kind of things. And I think like, this is where the, the, the mythology that's embedded in a, 
uh, in in D and D can really uh, run right up against the needs of being able to play the game and having uh, things be accessible and, and relatable uh, that uh, every every group has to find where they fall uh, on that. But uh, yeah, that's a wow. I had a lot to say about the lore of furbogs there. So, <laughs> surprised. Uh, uh, mechanically, they got a lot of cool stuff. Uh, I, I really do like them. I like the detect magic and disguise uh, self spells, and I like that you know that it, it it plays into their ability to hide. Both they can see, you know, the remnants of magic being cast by interlopers, or detect it from further away, uh, disguise themselves as simple woodsmen or hunters, uh, so that uh, they don't draw suspicion. Uh, but then hidden step is really cool. Like I want this on a ranger or something, you know, the ability to turn invisible to the starting next turn. Um, powerful build, you know, does what it does. Uh, but I, well, yeah, I don't know. I'll take a drink real quick, but this beast, this beast of speech and leaf. <laughs> speech of beast and leaf is, I'm, I'm going to read it to you guys because this is one of those things about some D and D abilities that I find walk up to the line of being interesting and useful and, and changing the way the game plays and then goes, Oh, that would be too cool. And then back off. Uh, you have the ability to communicate in a limited manner with beasts, plants, and vegetation. So thankful for the uh, clarification on plant creatures and vegetation. Um, they can understand the meaning of your words, though you have no special ability to understand them in return. It's just a, it's like, it's just, I don't know, I, that, you, know, you have advantage on all charisma checks you make to influence them, even though you have no idea if they're working or not. <laughs> I just, I, to me, that, that part of like, you can't talk back to them. Like you can't understand what they're saying is like, first off, how many times is speak with plants or speak with animals going to get cast in a campaign? Like a handful of times, you know, it's, it's not like they're stepping on a druid, really just a druid or, or ranger's toes in, in that sense. Um, having it be always on is really, you know, like it enhances the mystical nature of them. Like, yeah, they just get to talk to plants and you can have it have some other cost, maybe time. Maybe it takes a long time for a plant to reply, right? Like it, you have to spend an hour doing, you know, sitting with a flower, just caressing its petals and, sitting quietly smelling the pollen or whatever uh you know role playing with animals is to me one of the best parts about being a dm because it's fun to just sort of think what would this animal know about whatever it's a challenge it's in, it's a, it poses something that's really interesting uh and so yeah I, I i find that like this is one of those things where it's like this could be really cool and really highlight the connection that fur balls have and, but why would we let, make it be useful by letting you understand what they're saying? I'm like, come on, it's so hard to get information to players. There's only so many ways that you can get the details of an adventure to them. Why put more barriers in front of that? Well, I, you know, unless it's, gonna, unless it's gonna make for something interesting that they have to overcome. Um, and for me, that, that's, just, that's not, the, uh, you know, race feature isn't the, the place to put those kind of complications. So just be like, you can talk to plants and animals, it just takes a while. Because they're plants and animals, <laughs> you know, and then you're like, okay, we'll use persuasion on them, or you know, animal charisma, animal handling, you know, something like that. Um, that could be fun. Anyway, that's my rant. It's about letting your players talk to small critters who be Disney princesses before they go be murder hobos. It's balance. That's how you get the balance. Anyway, <laughs> take a few more else questions. <laughs> Thank you, Drake. I appreciate that other. Um, just a mailing address success. Uh, I believe uh, Web, uh, WebDM will be able to handle that. Thank you, uh, WebDM chat. As uh, handled as ever by our omnicompetent uh, CEO, Emma Lambert. Um, all right, here we go. We've got some other uh, questions here. Okay, we already uh, got that one. Yeah, so we've got some off-topic ones. That's fine. We can have some off-topics. Uh, uh, all right, so this is from Travis. Travis Packard asks, how would you run a cooking competition for your players against a group of NPCs? Ooh, okay. So, all right. I think I, there's, 
all right, let me, let me, I'm going to think through some ideas here and, and we'll see if it, it has any kind of coherence. So it's going to be built on a group check, right? I really like uh, a single group check of everybody's making, you know, everybody, this represents, a, you know, 10 minutes of work or 30 minutes, or you're just you're, uh, deciding on a time interval for the competition, right? It, it is going to be crucial. How many decision points within this limited amount of time do you want the players to have you know uh, you can assign sort of proficiencies whether they're skill proficiencies tool proficiencies whatever uh, to you know being able to make a check or as a prerequisite like you have to have cook utensils proficiency to make any of these checks otherwise you're at disadvantage something like that uh, and then it's like okay if you've you know, is it, is it uh, <laughs> you know, is it one of the lore skills that you want to bring up because you're trying to make a dish that has some sort of specific significance to it? So it's like, is a particular dish that was served at a, a historical dinner, was, you know, that that's relevant to this uh, moment, that it's history, or it's like, is this a dish that has a magical significance somehow where it's seen as as eating it this is a real thing in the real world where uh, people in uh, medieval times would make dishes that aligned with their astrological signs their zodiac uh, and whichever one was you know predominant in the sky so that they would be fortuitous they're auspicious meals right uh, <laughs> astrologically aligned meals and D, D people are doing this all the time so like there's ways to interject it in there is there a place for magic? What, what does the magic do? Does it give them an automatic success, advantage, whatever? But the group check, because it's everybody um, it, participating, gives you four different outcomes instead of just the normal two, pass, fail, because it gives you a chance for uh, basically, essentially what's partial success, which is some succeed, enough succeed that we succeed, um, but still some failed. Uh, total success, which is everyone succeeded, and then partial failure, which is you know, some people succeeded, but not enough. And total failure, which is like nobody succeeded. And those four outcomes make for much uh, richer and more meaningful uh, way to handle the situation and give you more complications to build on so that the next round of group checks for whatever time interval you're dealing with it is, uh, you know, grows from or is, um, in, you know, informed by what happened in the first set. So if you have a first set and that first set represents gathering the ingredients, right? And this is super simplified, you know, and it's everybody's making checks. Some people are making nature checks. Some people are making the perception. Some people are making, you know, you, you're like, okay, acrobatics for, <laughs> for knife skills or something, right? I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, make sure you don't cut a finger, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, but it, you get a partial success there. So of those PCs as part of the group check that failed, what were the consequences of their failure? What were they rolling for? Was it to find something specific? Was it to, to, you know, to get a certain recipe? Okay, maybe they found that the ingredient, but not enough, or they couldn't find the recipe, and, and, but, but they do have something else. You know, they, they, they found other ones that'll work for what they have. You know? uh, as long as the outcome of a failure isn't you can't proceed forward, then you, you should be good. And for me, this is one of those things where I don't, wouldn't really have any more of a system than that. Um, and maybe if I was adding something else, I would add a little bit of like for every success in a particular group check, roll a D6, the, keep a running tab of the total of those D6 rolled. And then when it reaches a certain number, then you're done. Until it reaches that, we're making group checks. You know, that, that's one way to do it. Or you could just have a set number of group checks. Uh, and then it's like if, you know, if after four rounds of group checks, you haven't succeeded on at least, you know, half of them, or maybe do like two out of three or something, um, you know, then it's over. Uh, so yeah, I would do something like that is, is how I'd structure it. But it, so much of something like a skill challenge is the narrative elements. It's easy to get caught up in the mechanical parts of it, but you have to interject meaning into the decisions they're making, why they're choosing certain skill proficiencies over others. Uh, what choices they're making in, in, in that moment and like what the consequences are for failure. So it means something and because otherwise it can be very mechanistic. I could take the, the sweetness out of that scene. It might flow mechanically, but it would be juiceless as a role-playing experience. So thank you, Trevor. That's, that's a good, uh, 
a, a good um, question. You might you want to check out uh, Adamantine Chef by Teo Sabadia, uh, friend of the show. Uh, it's a uh, it's a module. I want to say it's I don't think it's Adventurers League, uh, but it is specifically about a cooking competition <laughs> that it, it, it is an adventure. So if you haven't checked that out, maybe get some inspiration from that. Uh, but yeah, all right. Let's see, Paul Herman. Gonna get uh, we're gonna answer Paul's. I got two more, and then we're gonna head out. But um, <clears throat> Paul asked, it says, uh, on Wizards doing something new, <laughs> what do you think about the new adventure collection, Radiant Citadel, uh, whatever it's called, Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's not out yet, is it? It may be because I am very behind on D and D releases. <laughs> um, I love adventure, adventure anthologies. Uh, I thought Candle Keep Mysteries was cool. Love Tales of the Yawning Portal. I love short three to four sessions to get through this thing, adventures. Uh, and so I'm always in favor of ones like that. Uh, I think a book that is exploring other real world cultures, mythologies in a way that respects those cultures, in a way that does, you know, does due diligence and presents them as places for you to enjoy and you can feel good about it. <laughs> you know, you, you don't feel like, well, I, I don't know, am I, am I engaging with something that I will find questionable later is a real question for a lot of people. And so having something that's like, hey, this, look at all these other things I get to experience, all these new mythologies and, and new stories I didn't know about from, from real places that are then turned into D&D adventures, because that's what D&D does. D&D does that with everything that it's gotten its hands on from King Arthur and the Greek myths to everything. And it sometimes does not handle that well. Many times does not. And so having a book that's like new stuff from uh, designers and writers who are approaching it from good faith perspective and presenting something that's fun and inspirational and new is awesome. And I always support that, even if the specific expression isn't like to my tastes. You know, like I didn't really care for Strict Saving, but I, I'm glad it's a book that exists because it, it gives a different D&D experience. Um, so for me, um, yeah, I, I, I'm really looking forward to it. I don't know. I don't know if it's out yet. I, I don't think so, but I bet it is soon. I don't know. Who, who knows? I mean, actually, it's probably only a few clicks away, but I'm not going to do that on a live stream. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I will be checking it out and we'll have some kind of video, whether it's a live stream walkthrough of it or a video review uh, or something because simply because it is new. There's just you know new stuff, uh, new settings and new inspirations. Uh, and I'm always excited uh, about that. All right, here's our last question. Uh, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting a secret missive from my uh, from a mysterious uh, source that it is not yet out, but will be in uh, August. Which I also thought that was when Spelljammer was, but who knows? It'd be good if they came out together. Uh, Tom Lamp asks, <clears throat> I'm running a Spelljammer game. And my players are wanting to haul cargo. How would you handle arbitrage, buy low, sell high, and how would you recommend making it interesting? Thanks again. That's a tough one, I think. <laughs> uh, for me, like you could make it a mini game, but then is it one of those things that like players are like one or two players are going to engage with and then the rest won't. And that may or, be, may or may not be worth your time uh, and, and their time as well, in which case, uh, go nuts. Just a second. Excuse me. Um, so for that, I like, when I'm thinking about making it interesting, like in the early days of trade, right? We're, we're talking like the age of sale, you know, the, you know, within the first century of a joint stock company. What, what makes trade interesting is like you, it has to be done to keep this boat afloat. You have to take on as much as you can to sell at the next port because by the time you get to the next port you will have shed so many planks and sailcloth and yards of rope and fresh water and food and fuel and like constantly just shedding things as the boat is repaired and rebuilt and repainted and scrubbed and, and frayed ropes are thrown overboard it's, it's shedding all this stuff so you, you need that churn you need to be engaged in commerce 
in order to keep the venture going. And then you hope that you can make it worth it. Right? You hope that you find something so valuable that it makes all that hassle worth it. And so like, I'm, I'm at the moment off the top of my head, like I'm struggling to, to make, to make that not tedious. Right. Like, so if you had some way where it's like the, the, the medium through which the spell jammer is, is passing, whether it's the phlogiston or the astral sea or whatever, you know, is caustic. It, it wears away at things. Maybe it's like, you're, you know, you're not supposed to be here, right? Like th these are magical vessels <laughs> created for the purpose of, of, of traversing this otherwise hostile environment that, that separates the boundaries between worlds. Like you're, we're not supposed to be passing through this. So there's always this uh, cost that's involved to traveling. So you need to find the things that make it worth it. And then to me, the big draw of, of actual trade is to make the things that you're trading interesting, both valuable and useful. So like magical materials, the things that, that change the way, like, you know, like spell components that, that are beyond, like you need this to cast the spell, but if you use this to cast the spell, it does something different or does something extra so that you make it, you make acquiring the items interesting for the players because they're useful for them in the traditional game of D&D. Like this, you know, changes their experience because we have, we got all these magic crystals that when we rub our, you know, swords and axes against them, it, it, it imparts a magical quality to them. But we found so many of them. We have all we need and we can sell more. You know, that, that's, I think that's the sweet spot of it. Because like when you're talking about adding something to a game like D&D &D, and it's not about that core loop of playing your character, exploring an environment, interacting with the creatures and doing, you know, occasionally doing battle, getting treasure. But it's about that first person experience. Like it can just be hard to, to make it uh, interesting. Um, as much as possible, I would make all this random. I would not try to come up with a system of which places value what goods and, and what don't. I would probably come up with like 20 trade goods that are appropriate. And, that, and that's a lot, right? Like you might start with 10 just to keep it manageable and avoid the, like start just brainstorming everything, but then like get rid of all the obvious ones because the obvious ones are going to be the ones that lose interest the, the most. And then you pick the ones that are like the most evocative. You know, what does it mean to the people to have these? What, 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 what does having an abundance of one of these resources mean for, for someone in the setting? Now you know uh, how valuable it is, what people are going to do for it. Play, you know, NPCs can request that the PCs go find a source for some of these trade goods. Um, those are the ways that you can make like that part of the game uh, be more engaging and, and more interesting. Uh, and then you put those, the sources of those trade goods in places where there's adventure and conflict and, and the like, they, they're not just going to like go somewhere and talk to a factor or, a <laughs> you know, our Harbor master and, 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 you know, adjust some ledgers, they've got to go adventure to get it always put what they're looking for, you know, in an adventure, uh, as opposed to just talking to an NBC and, and running the numbers um that's that is that is my having never done this before how uh, uh how i would approach it uh answer but uh, good luck it's i think it's an interesting part of playing that kind of game and can be rewarding uh, there's definitely ways to make it interesting and to me they center around not straying too far from the core loop of dnd and making the things that uh, they're interacting with those trade goods be interesting in and of themselves as opposed to bolts of cloth and boxes of wool and stuff like that <laughs> anyway uh good luck i hope it works out and uh, i hope the uh, spell jammer release later on is uh, useful for you uh tom but uh yeah we're uh we're gonna take off here probably gonna be doing live streams breaking down monsters of the multiverse uh for the next few weeks only got through for about uh fur bulg uh today but uh that's fine that's what i wanted to get through because then we get to start with ganasi genasi genocide whatever you guys want to call them i undoubtedly will pronounce them in a way that infuriates 
some or all of you. So please don't miss that uh, next week. <laughs> Until then, check us out on Patreon and uh, over at our Twitch channel on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays at 8 p.m. And uh, we'll see you later.